For those who have downloaded this slides before, or can you uh, re-download because I add on some slides for revision, right? updated, get the latest version. Okay, so everything, everyone, everything is good. Over here, the place I'm living is a uh, little bit drizzly, I think, right? Uh, outside is still quite dark. Right. Ready. Oh, recorder has started. Thank you, Jing Hao. Okay, let's start. So, you, you, for those who miss out this session, they can refer to our recording. All right. So, let's do recording. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jing Hao. Because on my side, I'm not authorized to do recording. <laughs> Okay, let me refer to the slides. Recording now, uh, 20 minutes recording. Okay, let's get started. Module 14, ladies and gentlemen, cloud architecture and best practice. So at this stage, at the end, congratulations, we have come to the end of this module. And then through your practical, our discussion and your assignment, uh, you have a picture how your web application looks like could it be based on ec2 you have to manage the server all right or all, all of the tedious work you have done by yourself to manage the server and hosting your application could it be serverless architecture right which our developer can focus on coding and they as for the server at management administration uh, hopefully you can reach zero server administration uh, where the AWS cloud service provider will manage the server infrastructure for us. So we more or less have a picture over there. So uh, bring this picture with us when we go through the revision slides. And when we discuss, uh, we will highlight to you uh, some of the best practices, best practice, right? Because you know, when we build our web application, we have more than one way to to do it right so based on use case and then we figure out what could be the best practice and in the first place we may not know what is the best practice so what we can do is just try it out and uh, experimentation testing and uh, and then improve right uh, so this is a continuous process okay so as for the format of this uh, coming exam, uh, we have uh, MCQ. Uh, all together have 10 MCQ questions. So secure coding, five, cloud computing, five. Structured question, or you call short questions, we have four. So cloud computing got two, and secure coding got two. So it means 50% is on secure coding, 50% is on cloud computing. So the topics covered is these are the lectures and then all the quiz you have tried before. I strongly encourage you to have time to, to try the quiz again. Uh, take a note, not all the modules are in the list. Yeah. So module seven is not there. Module 11 is not there. Module 13 is not there, right? So if you go to the blackboard, I have put uh, behind the module, I put optional, right? That means it's good to know, but not covered in the exam. Yeah, so this is basically the stuff. Uh, this music actually is. Seems that no time to enjoy. Move on. All right. So last revision session one, we highlight to you throughout our module, we are talk about web service. Right? Could be the web service we are building in our assignment. Let's say you are doing slash user slash listing. Right. So once this web service or you call web API or RESTful service is ready. And then the client 
will be able to invoke these services by sending HTTP request. Or uh, let's say, give me the listing, give me the world listing, give me the first listing, give me user one, and so on and so forth. So in the HTTP request, it contain uh, the JSON format, all the parameters you need to pass to the web service to process. After the finished processing, right, your web service will return HTTP response. Response itself is a JSON format, right? So uh, they, this is a so-called API, application programming interface, right? Let's get an example. For example, if we have uh, S3 uh, is a web service, right? And then we want to put a picture into this S3 service. So we set HTTP request, right? And then inside HTTP request body, we have the picture, which is a binary, all right? Since putting the payload, putting to the payload. Yeah, and then the request look like this. HTTP method uh, put, this is the image. And we say, oh, web service, uh, we talk, each other, we talk to each other using HTTP, but HTTP got many versions, so let's use HTTP this version to talk to each other. And then in the request, you see what's the bucket name, put in the host, part of the host region, right? And then in the header, uh, you have authorization. So of course, not everybody can just put the message, uh, put a picture into the SG bucket. Right, so it must be authorized. So there's a token over here inside the HTTP request, and then over here is a payload. Right, the payload. This is the size of the pictures. Okay, we'll get it done. Yeah, so if everything is fine, right, uh, then this guy process, process this S3 web service process. And uh, store the put the picture into the bucket specified in the request and send the response back. So the response is very simple, either it's okay or not okay, right? So just say okay, then you we do not have anything in the HTTP response body, only the header. So okay, and then a couple of headers over there. So take note uh, in the response, the content length is zero. The request content length is the size of the picture you put in a payload. In the response, we don't have any payload. So look at the header content length, zero, right? And then there is something called e tag. Basically, it's a hashtag. So what if when the pictures uploaded to S3, someone intercept, right? And change the picture and forward the request all the way until reach this uh, S3 web service. And then the data, the picture itself, right, uh, has been changed. Right? So this is a violation of integrity. How to do the integrity checking? So I have to receive this response, receive this picture, right? In the response, they will generate a e tag, right? So based on this, Right, we will know whether the picture we sent to to the S3 web service has been changed. So this is for I. This is e tag is for integrity check. Integrity check. Right. And at this stage, some students say, "Oh, see, in my in my lab, uh, when they put the picture into the bucket, uh, we never construct the raw HTTP request. After I put the picture into the packet, into the SG, I never see this raw HTTP response come back to us, right? We just say, blah, 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 okay, fairs, and then so on and so forth. Yeah, so what is happening? Yeah. Remember this picture? So in our Assignment in our lab, we use Node.js, but in our Node.js, we never construct this raw HTTP request to put a picture into S3. Instead, we work together with AWS SDK. 
and AWSDK will construct this raw HTTP request like this. Yeah, someone do this for us. And I will put the picture over there. The raw HTTP response is come to us, but not direct to us, but it will go through the SDK. So SDK process the response, uh, tell, tell us if everything is okay to our application, right? So this work has been done by SDK. AWSDK for S3, for, for DynamoDB, the same, right? Yeah. Yeah, so of course you can create a bucket, you can uh, put a picture, use the AWS console, right? AWS console. So again, AWS console, these client side, they will construct this raw HTTP request process response by the code over here. So for, as a user, as a administrator, we don't see this. However, take a look at this line. At this stage, uh, we need to go to the basic. You can construct HTTP raw request by yourself, send to API. When this guy process the response, you will be able to receive the raw HTTP response as shown in the previous slides. You have this choice. Yeah, so basically pretty very simple. Before I confuse you, you can simply come here, use a Postman, right? Then you postman construct this request with the help of postman, set these uh, headers, uh, put the picture inside the body, and you will be able to do this. Ding dong, and then the picture will be sent. All right. Yeah. To summarize on this on these slides, what I then mean is AWS service is a RESTful service, is a web service, is a web API, right? Uh, similar to the web API we are building ourselves. In order to use this service, right, you can do this. You can use AWS console. You can use AWS command line interface. You can write the code using work together with SDK. Three ways, right? Number four, you can construct the raw HTTP directly and send the request through API to the service you are using, right? So let's give you an example. You have an EC2 instance up and running over there, right? How are you going to be able to stop it? Go through API. How do you go through API, right? I write a code. I say at this time, from this time, I want to stop my instance. So you write the code together with AWS DK. So this guy will construct the HTTP request and then to this service, stop the instance. Alternatively, you can use AWS command line interface. Uh, this guy again will work with AWS DK. It's just a command, right? For example, I can't remember the command. It like AWS EC2 stop the instance and followed by instance ID. Then they will construct this HTTP request response. Or you go to the console, right? You do it, stop the instance. Or you write a code, right? Or use Postman to construct the raw HTTP request and then send to API to stop the instance, uh, similar to this one. Yeah. So four ways to interact with our services, web services. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now at this stage, you may wondering, I have created a slash user slash listing web service API. How can I call this this guy uh, or true API? But we don't have command line interface to interact with your web service. We don't have SDK generated for the web service you created, right? Or console. So the only way for us to interact with our, our own web service to create by ourselves is through this guy. Yeah. So along the way, you may wondering, hmm. I want to generate SDK for my slash user service. I want to generate SDK for my listing service, right? So the question is, if you want to do so, how, what tools you can use to generate SDK for your web service? Yeah, 
So the question is, you have a slash user or you have a slash listing uh, this web service, right? You can, the user can get the listing users from you, right? Then you notice that uh, the way to call your API uh, is to choose this HTTP request response, right? A uh, very tedious. So can you generate a SDK for your web service? that even yourself using your rest of service or other developer use your web service will become more productive right so if this is the case what tools we can use to generate the sdk for your service what tools any idea Tom. It, it, it's okay. Huh? This the uh, Cloud Nine may let me see Cloud Nine. May I have the the tools? Is what we used before. You just we use part of the function. It's called API Gateway. <laughs> AWS Web API Gateway. So this gateway, you know, is put in front of your, 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 your web service, for example. And then this guy can help us to generate the SDK for the service you are creating. Yeah. So actually, Web API Gateway, they have a couple of uh, many features. So in our, in our assignment, in our learning, uh, we just explore part of it, right? So continue to explore, right? Uh, to for this, this proceed, huh? Yeah. Yeah, maybe in the future, uh, maybe in the future, uh, yeah, in the cloud nine, they may they may incorporate this part. Yeah, possible, possible, possible. All right. So we talk about this. Oh, develop application. Uh, we we might want to make it a, a high available and high scalable application. So we talk about this before. So where we are from, where we are now, we have a web server hosting a web application. We have a single web server Ubuntu over there. We spend a lot of time admin the server, uh, manage the runtime environment, and hosting our, our code, running, testing, done. Right. So in the reality, we may need to have more than one web server hosting the same application. Right. So in the Grab or Netflix, they may have two. 200 or 300 web services over, over there, right? So we are moving along the way, right? So this will enhance this uh, scale uh, availability. If one web server done, the uh, other web server can take over, can, can handle the request. Does the user don't know which web server is done? It doesn't matter. This Our application is still available, right? And then for the database side, uh, we can choose where we provision RTS, uh, you may or may not notice there's a checkbox ask you, do you want to have a standby created for you? Right, so by default it's not selected, but you can do so. And then once this guy is done, this database standby will be able to take over. And this takeover is transparent to our code. Our connection tree is point to the domain name of this database. If this is working domain name map to this IP address, if this is take over, fair over, the domain name is mapped to this IP address. So our code, no need to change, right? When this database uh, fair over happening. Yeah, so this, you see this version uh, based on what we have done. And then I think you are ready to move to some of the architecture over here to further enhance make our application more fault tolerant and more highly available and scalable. Yeah, just imagine your assignment <clears throat> is for your own company and your company is uh, online business is rely on this application. So naturally you will think of these features you have to put into your application. 
make it highly available, fault tolerant, make it in you know, such a way they can handle large number of traffic requests come to our application, right? So we will literally we will continue to improve our architecture, our application, right? So that's a natural thing. Uh, yeah. So last time we talked about the scaling, right? So as number of users come to us more and more, request more and more, experience a flood of, of requests, right? You can consider to upsize your server. You remain the number of servers as one, but we upsize, upgrade our virtual server. So in the, this is a service. Don't forget, right? It's just it's an HTTP request through console or through the code, right? To change these parameters, number of virtual CPU, number of memory, all of this can be done by our coding, right? Coding, yeah, so powerful. Coding is so powerful, right? Of course, we, yeah, if we don't code properly, it can be dangerous as well, it can be risky. And you have vertical scaling, scaling. We, of course, we have horizontal scaling. Come to the picture as we see uh, <clears throat> before. Yeah. So this is the stuff. Today, <clears throat> we noticed we have 10,000 users come to our application. We have 200 web servers, we have 300 application servers working on it. Once we our application experience a flood of our requests come to us, we monitor the web server. Hey, not so busy like, in terms of CPU usage, memory usage, because we have enough resource over here, enough resource over here. But the, our user, our 10,000 concurrent users still experience the, the latency. Now what's the problem? I say, oh, the database is so busy. A lot of read, especially a lot of read traffic happening over here. So everyone is waiting, waiting, user is waiting. So uh, you, so if this is the case, uh, we can put the cache in front of this database. So our application code need to change a little bit, right? If you need to get data from database, you first check the cache is available. If available, just get the data from cache, return JSON, pass to the user. If you're not available, go ahead to the database, get the data and cache the data in the cache and then return the result to the user. For subsequent requests for the same data, the cache will be here, right? But a cache, there is a TTR, you, you remember, right? Time to leave. How long this data you decide your use case will be stored over there, right? It will be cached over there. <clears throat> so again, this is a, a web service. This cache is, is a web service we talked before. This is like a Lego, is like a building blocks. Uh, you, may, you may consider uh, to use in your future application. Right? Yeah. Yeah, can be very amazing, right? When later on you have this, you test the performance of your application. Uh, right. <clears throat> so how the cache helps? Now, if you re recall the application we talked about before, uh, NQC Income Relief Fund, right? So they experienced a flood of requests, the backend very busy. So in the end, the application is not available and they take offline some more at this critical time, right? So what they did is they found out they have to use a queue system. Right. SQS simple queue system is a web service. We talked about it before, but the, 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 the function is a queue. Uh, some part of your application, for example, web service can put the message into the queue, and some web service can get the message from the queue. And then these two web services basically communicate with the queue in an asynchronous fashion. If web service one put message is a queue, if web service two is not there, it doesn't matter, right? When web service two is up and running, they will go to the queue to retrieve the message and process, right? So this is a very much asynchronous way of communication by using this simple queue service. 
We spent some time talk about this before. So in the revision, what are the things that can highlight to you? Yeah. Yes. So you see over here, ding dong, once the request come to you, oh, you must ding dong, ding dong, busy, busy uh, processing, right? And then give the user is waiting for the result. Of course, in the processing, you may go to the, to the database to perform this transaction, all right? And so and so first, all right? So, Look at this picture. What we did is instead of this guy request come to us with direct processing, so we put it inside the queue, right? And then this web service or application running here gets a message from the queue, right? Uh, so these two pictures, when you have time, you 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 compare these two. Some use cases this is fine, right? For the income relief fund application. They used to be like that. Now they are doing this, right? Put a queue in between. Okay. So the best way to understand this is uh, YouTube application. So when the user upload a YouTube video, okay, this backend, this service, this application say, uh, okay, I put in your queue already, your video. And then this service, or part of the application, get the message from the queue, process the video. Once the video finished processing, uh, you notify the user, oh, your video is ready. Right? So no one is under stress. User know you, he will be notified, your backend, take your time based on your resource, how fast you can process the request, right? Yeah. So this queue is very, very useful in this use case. So in general, if the user request sent to you really, really take a long time, take a lot of resources to process, right? This is a good place to consider if we can put the queue over here, right? And then process in your own pace based on the resource we have in our backend, right? You can take a short break. They come back, get the message from the queue, right? So everybody is happy, right? Everybody is happy, yeah. So this queue is kind of decoupling, right? Since these are examples. So you see this microservice, this microservice communicates with each other through HTTP API directly, right? So everyone could be under stress, especially if this microservice call this microservice, this microservice take a long time to process, right? Yeah, this guy keep waiting. So why you are so slow, right? So instead, you see these two, they don't communicate directly. They don't communicate directly, right? They put in a queue, right? And then forget about it, right? His job is done. And then this microservice get the message from the queue, right? And they process it, yeah, no stress, okay? So these are the beauty of your asynchronous communication. You increase the reliability. Why? Because if you communicate like this, if this guy is an MC, if this guy take a coffee break, right? If this guy is too busy, then this link may be done, right? Then you, our application may throw the error. But we use this, even though this microservice is temporarily not available, when this guy is up and running, Right, they can take the message from the queue. The business process still continue. The workflow still continue. And user is happy when they use our application. Could it be mobile, could it be IoT, could it be web, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, scalability, yeah, so these are the beauty of it. But uh, our common sense tell us, yeah, some use case, the queue could be useful. Yeah. And then you may wonder in this guy, why in the first place this team never implement this queue itself, right? Yeah. So this part I don't know. Uh, I guess at that time they may not think of this approach, right? Or at that time it's so difficult to implement a queue in the team, right? But now for us, this queue, right, no matter how complex, right, 
it is. It is implemented as a web service provided by AWS cloud provider. Imp design, implemented, deployed by this pool of AWS professionals. So our job is go to the API call API to put this message into the queue. <clears throat> API to pull the message from the queue. So we are just use it. So anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. Anybody can do it, right? So that's the beauty of the service. So these are the other stuff. So you have a time, you take a look at these uh, lessons from 10 years of experience of AWS. Some part we kind of highlighted embrace failures right yeah don't do local state right infrastructure as a code i just mentioned asynchronous event driven right? that's a beautiful pattern right yeah don't forget to scare the database how to do it measure 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 right experiment 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 and can yeah so i this part i leave to you i think yeah so now let's talk about another part is uh, session management, uh, session management. So we understand when the user come to your assignment application, right? You will give the home page. After that, click login, right? They, they do authentication, right? And then behind the scene, you give a just call to the web service to perform this authentication. And then this user, after authentication, click here, click there, they all together send you 20 requests right until this guy say look out or time out session terminated so what do you mean by session one user one session 10,000 users you have 10,000 sessions right right so every session from one user right they may have one request 10 requests 100 requests right it's just bundled as one session for this user one. The user two, they have a, another 20 requests come from user two. This is user two session, right? If your user session management consume a lot of resources, right? Uh, so this will affect the scalability, right? Uh, affect the scalability because one user, one session, right? Because after authentication, you must store the session uh, information, right? Like, like a session ID, what's the user name, what's the role of the user, and so on and so forth for each user, right? So these are the things. Now, I want you to think about your assignment. Uh, uh, you give me a homepage, I come to you, and then I start authentication successfully. And then um, many, many requests come to you from this user, Mr. G, right? And then say, look out. Or oh, I forgot to look out. You have the feature for timeout as a security feature, session timeout. So session start, session end. So when the session will end, right? So this is a question. Oh, sorry. When the session start, when the, the user one, right? This is user one come to your application and then user one start the session. So when the session start, right? When the session start, so or say, oh, when you come to home, my home page uh, is already start session already. Uh, when you authenticate, right? Authenticate. Right? After login, authenticate successfully, and then the session start. So uh, you think about this, when a user won't come to application, you give this guy a home page. Uh, at this time, the session starts, or later when the user click login, login successfully, authenticate the user successfully, then the, the session for this user one starts. So when you think the session starts, when do you think the session starts? Quan uh, say two, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can be one also. Yeah, so either of this choice is correct. So <clears throat> what that means is in the slides, I just highlight to you. 
when the user come to your, let's say I'm a user, I come to your assignment homepage, right? Actually, I will already start the session, but this session is called pre-authentication session. Pre-authentication session, start already. And later on, after I click login, authenticate success, success, successfully, so it's just like a authentication, authenticated session starts over here, right? So can be one, can be two. So it's important the session, pre authentic session, need to be terminated after the new session starts, right? You need to terminate. That means after the authentication, you need to start a new session, yeah, or, or slash, what that means, pre authentic session need to be terminated, right? It to be terminated explicitly. After this, you start a new session. Okay, wait, wait, wait. You have one step, one line of code need to be done, which is terminate this previous session. Right. So if you're missing one line, uh, this is a vulnerability. Okay. Another vulnerability in our assignment one, in our application is, <clears throat> later I will highlight it, never ever authenticate the user by yourself. Yeah. Because you write the code, you know how to go to user table to authenticate user to see where the user ID password matches the record over there, right? But our implementation basically is easy for the hackers to hack our authentication. So as a good practice, if you have a web service, REST for service, web API, whatever service provide authentication, right? you should plug in this to your application. Yeah, you don't do it yourself. Okay. Uh, this is not saying to make our code easy, right? Or we are lazy, we don't want to do authentication ourselves, right? No. Yeah. So just give one example. You see, if I go to CPF application, CPF, they used to have their own authentication, right? CPF. Right. If I go to whatever application, but most of government application, web application, they use SIMPASS to do authentication. Right. After authentication, of course, you still have to manage the session yourself. Right. How about this user? Right? So this is a, a example. <clears throat> OK. So once the user, uh, this is not relevant to our. Okay, so after the user authenticate already, then you have to remember, oh, there was a username, uh, what's the user role, uh, and the traitor, or, or, or all of the things, right? So where to store this session status, all right? You can store in the memory, uh, on your virtual machine, right? Uh, uh, the good approach is to store, the, we talked about this before, right? Is to store the session status, let's say this user ID, when they log in, what's the username, and then the role of the user, you just put a, one record, one item in a DynamoDB table, right? Put here, at this place, sounds good, why? Let's say I'm user one, I send 10 requests, to your application. So the first request, I log in successfully. My request go to this instance. So this instance will store my session status in the DynamoDB. Then user one send a second request. And this request is served by this instance. So they say, okay, you, you send me the request. Huh? I don't know who you are. Eh? I don't know whether you have authenticated yourself already. Right, so this application, same, go to this DynamoDB to check if the item is there, right? And then proceed. Yeah, so this is a good place to manage the session, store the session status over here. 
And then even you have 10,000 users, this DynamoDB, no SQL database will be able to handle this volume of data. And the throughput is very, very fast. Because you don't want to put it in the in the SQL database, because the SQL database where you access the session status for this user one could be very, very slow, right? The throughput is very slow, right? So DynamoDB is a good place, right? Good place, yeah. So you see in our assignment, we in the DynamoDB, we just some some group put the user data over there, some group put the listing data over there. Right, so how to use this DynamoDB is really up to your imagination. In this case, we tap on, we put the session status over here. We manage the session over here. The status for user one, user two, just different record, different item, right? Yeah, that is very, very fast. Even if you have 10,000 user sessions, this data DynamoDB will be able to handle is a scalable session store. So in the future, guys, uh, when you work on your assignment, final project, industrial attachment, right? So uh, think about these building blocks you are familiar with, but just use it uh, not to store the, uh, the what do you call this uh, users data or listing data. You just put the session status over here, right? Mm. Uh, so this picture is very interesting. Then you can put in the cache as well. The session status can put in the cache faster, but it's not permanent. Uh, this guy is kind of permanent, right? This guy, no, right? Right. So in our assignment, yeah, so we have one, two, three, four to manage the session, right? SQL, we, we say you can do it, but it's very slow to retrieve the user's status, session status. No SQL is a good choice. Caching also is not bad, right? Now, you just take a uh, take a look at your assignment. When the user log in, right? So you must remember or store the user name, user role, or when this guy log in, so and so forth. This so-called session status for this user one. Similarly, you have to session status for user two. You have 10,000 users, you have to do this, right? So in your assignment one, where do you store the user's information? Where you store the session status in your assignment? Let's just take a look at what we have done. So your assignment, yes, correct. You store in the local storage. So this local storage is not bad. Huh? You see, huh? this local story, right? <clears throat> if you have one user, you store in your local story, which is client side in the browser. If you have two users, the user store in their own client browser local storage, right? So even though you have 10,000 users, right? Your back end, huh? does not have this pressure. All of my 10,000 users come to me, huh? how I'm going to save this 10 users, 10,000 users session status in my back end. My back end, I don't have enough resource. In this case, you don't have this problem <laughs> because every time the, the session, the username, whatever is stored in the local storage, which is located at the browser side. So you may have 10,000 users, you don't have any pressure on your back end to store the session status, right? Yeah, this approach not bad, right? But the best approach is this. Yeah. Is this. So is this. Yeah. So I will not explain in too detail. You, so at this stage, we don't have to say who is the best, who is the something, right? So we just we just be aware. We need to store the session status. Let's say after user log in, I know this name is Ji Xiang, right? So how to store it, all right? Uh, so be aware different ways of storing this and what's the impact, yeah? Okay, so that's a session management. All right, now we move to 
um, you see errors. Oh, this part. Uh, you have put some pictures uh, in S3. So this data, is, this is object, right? So the, uh, there you have many ways to store the data. So in this case, S3, mm, cloud storage is suitable to store this, all right? And then after two years, after two years, some of the data is basically outdated or not so popular. Why? Because the user come to your application, they hardly access this data, which is two years old, this picture, right? So what are we going to do with these pictures we have stored in this S3? But our user never access these pictures, right? So we would say the, the picture, the data used to be very hot, turn to warm, and they become very cold already. So what are we going to do? And then you check your cost, more and more object put in this S3, right? And then your cost is going up. And then one of the team members say, Olomar, for this data, three years old, I deleted, deleted, right? Deleted. And then on second thought, we say, actually, we cannot delete. Right? The reason is security and comply compliance requirement. Let's say you imagine there's some PDF file put here, right? For compliance requirement, we are, request, we are required to keep this data for, let's say, five years. You can't delete it. Right, and then the fact is the data is very cold, right? So how what to do? So you see over here, give you an example, is cheap, right? And then there's a glacier, it's cheap glacier, right? So you see the snow over here, you see the snow. You see, this is a looks like a bucket similar to S3, but they put a snow over here, right? That means it's very suitable for the cold data. Hey, also in this case, no one uses this PDF file anymore in our application, but we cannot delete it because of a security compliance requirement. So we move it to this S3 glacier. The cost is very low. Then the access timer is our set. Right, when you retrieve it, I will take hours to retrieve it. Whereas for S3 is millisecond, right? Millisecond, but it, it doesn't matter. Fulfill our requirement to meet this security compliance requirement. So one day the auditor come to us, they say, I want to take a look at the document uh, provided by this user, Jipe Xiam. Uh, where can you get this from me? He say, wait, 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 give me two hours. I will come back to you. So you retrieve this PDF files uh, kind of from this glacier, you save the cost. Yeah. So what data store should we use, right? So based, there is a key concept is called the temperature of data. How often this data will be accessed, right? In this, in this example, uh, we can move this data from SG after three years to do this. And this can be done automatically. Why? This is an AWS, this is a web service. This is a web service, right? So basically, you just set the rules, at what time, right? Uh, how long, uh, three years, and then they will automatically move, right? Automatic move, automatically can be done. Yeah. So just take a look at this uh, data temperature as a metaphor, right? 
Now we talk about cost, uh, cross origin resource sharing. So in our assignment, uh, practical, we encounter this. Yeah. So cost. Uh, say, oh, the cost enabled or not enabled, right? So uh, now is good time to reflect on it uh, based on our experience, right? I have a clearer picture about this concept. In course, cross origin resource sharing. So let's understand this res resource. Resource. What do you mean by resource over here? And we want to share in the, this resource. Yeah, what, what do you mean by resource? In this course, there is something called cross origin resource sharing. So let's just get an understanding of the resource. So what is the resource? What are the examples of the resource? In your assignment, in your practical, uh, maybe you recall it a bit. Yeah. Yes, API. Web API rest for service. And then you say, what API is supposed to be shared, right? What, what do you mean by cross origin resource sharing? What does that mean, right? Resource is a web API. Okay, this is a picture I copy paste from tutorial. Yeah, without permission of the authors. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is a very, very good picture I saw along the way uh, when people try to explain this. OK, let's back to our assignment, right? I want you to focus on this uh, top part, this part. OK, you see the trim? This top part. This part. Ignore the lower part. Right, OK. So, uh, you understand in your assignment, uh, you have two portions of source code. One portion of it is called static website, uh, the, 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 this stuff, HTML, JavaScript, this, right? Another part of this is backend, which is a web service. Yes, web service it is, a, is a resource, is a resource. Right. Now, take note. This static website, the client side, right? Static website and the web service, <clears throat> rest for service, this particular resource are put in the same server, hosted on the same EC2 virtual machine. Where did this guy come from? From this server. Where did this guy come from, from this server? Oh, I know uh, this guy and this guy is the same origin, right? Origin, oh, origin, origin, no. My pronunciation uh, sounds like orange, orange. Okay, never mind. From a user perspective, what is happening is I use my browser, which is my client, uh, Google Chrome, for example, running over here. I come to your website. You give me the HTML. Again, this pre-authenticate session starts. And then I click the button. I say I want to log in. And then the JavaScript behind the scene executed in this browser environment. And then they send a request to the resource, which is your login web service. Happen to be the same origin. Right, you see your HTML page is over here at this local host blah blah port number, and this web service is the same HTTPS local host port number, right? Is the same same port number, same port number, same port number. So we say the same origin, origin. So they this web service this resource invoked, they log in successfully. So they at this time we started this uh, uh, 
authenticated session already, and then they use the keep sending request to view your products. Okay, now let's move on to the lowest part of this application, same application. So what does this mean is the static website the, for the, from the, our assignment one, same application is hosted on this server one. So when the user requests, they request a server one IP address and then get this HTML page, right? Then we click the login button. They will request for the resource for login web API service. And this service is located at server two. It's different from this orange. Orange. This orange is server one, localhost one, right? Then when you send a request to this resource, which is not in the same orange, which is cross-origin resource sharing, right? Yeah. So sometimes you see, oh, cost not enabled. Wait, right? So the enable course need to be done at your web service. That means you say, oh, my web service is running on this uh, local host, whatever server. I allow this server one to, uh, I allow this server one website to call me, all right? So you just put the statement over here to in so-called enable course. So in our assignment, we do the practical, it's just one button enable the cost for this web API service. So once the user come to this website, uh, they, even though the service is in different origin, they will be able to invoke this service. Uh, you can take this as a security measure as well, right? If you don't enable other websites, they cannot call you. All right, so how does it look like? So I'm here, I build a web API service. This is a resource and then uh, there is a document I attach to this web service. I say, I allow the origin example.com to call me, call the web service. These are the allowed methods. I also allow example2.com to, to send a request to my service, right? Uh, so they, for others, they can only use get, right? So this documentation, course documentation, right, is associated with this web API service, right? So to enable the course, right? enable the course, right? So this is XML, guys. So XML stands for extensible markup language. Why is this, why is this document, this text file is extensible markup language? Because you can define your own tag. So here you see cost configuration, opening tech, slash cost configuration, closing tech. You can define other text, cost rules, opening, cost rules, closing. Uh, which or, or, orange you allow? Allow this guy, example one, right, to call you. Yeah. Allow example two to call you. These are allowed methods, right? So this is something happened over here. So this is another picture. So this is a course. Yeah, course. Any question about course? Okay, just highlight to you this part. <clears throat> Cross orange resource sharing. So this is a where this is a domain name, HTTP service dot this.com. So this is where this web API is hosted, right? Hosted. So once the user visit this website, right? And then after that, they will send a request to this service, right? 
yeah send to this so send to this service yeah so this is cross origin resource sharing right why because this is uh, looks like the same looks like the same origin right service.contos.com but the http this is https right so this is considered as cross origin resource sharing right yeah domain name different uh, uh, different port different port number let's say uh i come to this website service.contos.com a0 a0 after that your ajax request sent to request to this service right but this is still considered as cross or origin because this port is 80 but this guy is a0 a0 right so you order for this guy you come to the, this website you want for this website to call this you must explicitly enable right you say allow allow blah 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 to do what right to do what? okay so next chapter we will move to talk a little bit about microservice uh talk about what are the things you need to take note uh let me see uh still i think still got some of the uh, talk about security uh the api throttling yeah so these are the, some keywords come to us uh, yeah so i let us take a short break uh i think let's check what is allowed here the focus oh allow here the focus guanjin guanjin you are thinking now huh? good that means my explanation encourage you to think right okay <laughs> good uh, this is good right <laughs> yeah okay so put it this okay yeah so the the thing is uh some students uh, may not like like my presentation i right? say mr you are too slow all right mr you 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 kind of always uh ask us to think right yeah but the the thing is Every lecture, right, got strengths and weakness. So is Mr. Chia also got my weakness, right? So, so what is my strength? <laughs> the strength is I always ask you to think, because this is so important. It's so important. You know why? Because, because I, I always refrain myself from telling you the answer. I want to explain the question again, and again, give you hints, let you guys see the answer, explore. And the, this answer you got from this process is really yours. And then in this thinking process, right, our learning skills, our learning capabilities have been enhanced. Right? You are on the right track and you can try as well. You can, yeah. So back to the question, what is a lot harder for cost? Yeah, so the to. Let, let, let me give you a simple version first because I always give a long version. Simple version is because you think the cost is the R is for resource, right? And we talked about it before. Resource means what? Web API, right? 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 And when you call the web API back to the service we talked about it before. Because everything now is go back to the basics. That you may realize uh, a more the the the, this most important slide is this, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So you see the HTTP request, right? Right. So you're sending this request to the service, right? And then you send a request to the service. This is example, right? Right. So in the request, you you have the method over here, put, right? Have the put. You have the get. That resource, right? Let, 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 sorry, let me back to your assignment. Huh? You have a use slash users web service, right? When I have a method, you are asking me about a lot of header. Sorry, I'm explaining the methods. Sorry. So the methods could be get, get users, right? Could it be put or post to update? 
create new users or could it be delete, right? Could it be delete? Could it be delete? So in the course, you say, uh, I allow this website, uh, uh, I, allow, I, I, I allow this website from example one dot comma to call me. These are the allowed method. Oh yes, allowed method. Yeah, put post get delete. For others, uh, is put post and delete. Yeah, correct. So this is the method. Yeah, allow method. For other origin, they allow the method only get. So for example, if your resource is user, this guy can only from other website, they can only from other origin, they can only do the get, right? So allow header, yeah, you're right. The allow header in this case is they use, the allow header, right? They use this guy, right? They use these stars over here. Oh, very interesting. Huh? Let me see. Yeah, I cannot send this star to. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, means any any header, any header, any header. Yeah, is allowed. So, if you look at HTTP request, right? Just now we talk about. They have some of the headers, like the host header, data header, uh, and these are the headers, right? So we have no constraint on this header. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. All right, so shall we take a break before we move on to microservice? Uh, we have some part of microservice. So microservice basically, uh, we, we, we will talk later. Service, web API, throttling, uh, and yeah, and then a little bit about security. Yeah, so these are the remain topics we are going to cover. So let us have a short break. Uh, we start at 9.20, okay? 9.20, 10 minutes break. So these are the topics. We need to revise and uh, discuss with you, okay? Just take a short break. Let's play some music.
Uh, welcome back. So now is the rest of the session, maybe 20 more minutes. We will talk about microservice, what they care totally, and security. Uh, we have a module called uh, Cloud Security, Cloud Application Security. So I have copy paste some of the slides, uh, put in the revision slide. Let's highlight some of the key concepts uh, we need to be aware of. So microservice. So basically microservice is, <clears throat> is a REST for service, is a web API, is a web service. So when we say micro, that means, for example, in your application, uh, someone say, I can just build one service, one web API, one REST for service, I can do everything. Right? So this approach, uh, you make the service very heavyweight. Right. Instead, the better approach is to have a couple of smaller services, rest for service, which is very lightweight. They perform single duty, right? Oh, this is for users, this is for listing, this is for something else, right? For payment, right? So each service will make it uh, lightweight. So basically, this is a, a basic concept for microservice. But how small is that means you make as small, the smaller, the smaller, the better uh, may not be, right? So it's a balance, it's a kind of arts uh, more than uh, technology. So these are the microservices, is a web API, is a service, but it's a small independent services. So instead of create a powerful services can do a lot of things put together in one web service, probably we should have small uh, independent services and work together to perform the uh, tasks. Mm. So this is API, the service. So of course this service, this is, uh, you will written in Node.js, we need some code over there. Uh, they probably you need to go to some data store, whether it's RDS or whether DynamoDB or Elastic Cache to get the data to uh, to process. Yeah. And then, so this is one microservice with a small uh, micro. Uh, this is another one, the another one. So everyone is small, independent, and then they can work together to perform the tasks for our application. So in our assignment, we do have several services over there, right? It's microservices. Uh, however, right, take just one thing to highlight is every microservice, right, they have their own database. They have their own database. They have their own database, they have their own database. Compared to what we did in our assignment, we, even though we have service one, service two, service three, web service four, looks like they are sharing the same RDS, same database, which is different from this best practice we highlight over here. So in our team, right, 
uh, team member one is take care of the microservice A, team member B take care of microservice B, right? We are working the same team, but we decide to use the approach called microservice approach, right? So everyone got the database. Uh, this guy, service B, is using DynamoDB, and uh, this is using RTS. And then to perform the duty of this microservice A, they need some data from DynamoDB. Right. How the microservice A should get the data from the DynamoDB? Can I do like this? Two way. One way is this, this. Because I know the credentials, I know your Dynamo DB table, uh, table name, so I just do like this. Number one. Number two, do like this. Where your team do something like this. This is a common kind of approach or yeah, so I, I I should not commence. I just let you know this is one way. This way should not happen. All right. Should not happen. Because you see, uh, if I'm the team, take care of this microservice B. This is a database I'm taking care of. I'm responsible for the data over here. I'm accountable for the data integrity, whatever is over here. Yeah. So for me, more or less, this is an intruder. Right? Even though you are my team member, right? But you <laughs> intrude my data, <laughs> right? Right? Then if something wrong, I really don't know if I have done something wrong or some someone else just come here to to access change the data. I, I have no answer for it. I really don't know. So instead, for microservice A, if you need data, please, please don't come to my Dynamo DB table. Let me take care of it. If you need the data, you go to my API. This is approach. Yeah. So this is a guideline. This is a practice, good practice. Yeah, good practice. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing in this microservice, of course, you, it doesn't matter you are using uh, Java, for example, some are using Node.js, different uh, languages. So your team, you are using Node.js to build the REST for service, we call microservice A. In your team member, uh, implement microservice B using Java. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, right? So because when I call you, someone else call you, just simply HTTP request call to your API, right? Different languages can be used in the same team, uh, in the same team. So this is another beauty of microservice or web API. OK, so now <clears throat> there's another thing is hey, where, where is this guy? Security. So let me do this. In our assignment one, uh, for, uh, we have a web API, right? Yeah, and then through the API, this user is authenticated, authorized to access the resource or service through this API, right? But it could happen somewhere else may come to here to get this access to our web API. So web API security is important, is important, uh, very, very important. Yeah, so in this, in our assignment, what we did, we have a Node.js code, we we are building microservice or web API REST for service. When the request come to get the user or get the listing, our Node.js code will, be, will connect to the database. Based on the credentials, we hard code in our code, hard coded, hard coded. 
yeah, hard coding. So once we put our source code in S3 or put in the GitHub in the code repository, so please take a note, take away the user ID password in the connection uh, where you the, you need you connect to the database, right? Right, because if someone get your repository, they will get the credentials to a database, right? And then the, there is a possibility, the risk of uh, data leakage for your database. Mm. Now, we are thinking about this. Is that possible? We don't hard code. Yeah, you know, hard code, uh, the user is that we use admin and the password. We don't hard code these credentials for connect to the database, right? So then where we should put the credentials? Yeah, we should, we can put these credentials in this so-called secret, AWS secret, secret manager. It's a key value pair. So what's the admin, what's the username, what's the password over here for database credentials. So in our code, we don't have hard code. So what we did is we go to this credentials secret manager to get the credentials, right? Return and then use these credentials to connect to the database. So in this case, our credentials is not stored over here. It's stored securely by this service called secret manager. Yeah. So this is a, this is a good practice. This is a good practice. Good practice. Yeah, this is good practice. So this part is not tested in the exam, but when you way uh, this is a uh, important service you can tap on in the future. So you can put the credentials over here instead of hard code, right? Instead of hard code. Yeah. So of course you need to write some uh, more lines of code to get the credentials first. After you get the credentials from this secret manager, you use these credentials. Say database, I want to connect to you. Uh, this is my user ID. Uh, this is uh, my password. And database say, okay, connection successful. What you want? And they send a secret statement to this guy. Yeah. Uh, but there is a uh, one problem uh, in our assignment uh, so far, right? So is we hard code. We not only hard code the source code, the credentials over here, but the credentials we are using is the user IDs admin. This is a super user for a database. You can create database, you can create table, you can delete table. But you see in your web API, in your RESTful service or microservice, what you, you don't need to create table. You don't need to delete table. You don't need to create users for the database. All of the privileges are not necessary for this web API to perform its duty. Uh, uh, so we mentioned before, there is a principle called the least privilege principle. So this is a security vulnerability in our source code again, right? But so far I, ha I haven't found students uh, address this issue because from year one, when we connect to a database, we use admin. But then we use these credentials hard code in our code, right? But we don't need this power. We don't need this high privilege like this. So instead, you need to go to a database, MySQL bench, connect to it, and create a user for a database called user one, for example, and give just enough privilege to this user one. And using this user one to connect to the database in our code, or maybe the future put into the security manager. Okay, so this part, uh, please take note. Yeah, so is this clear about the database credentials? Yeah. So the, the principle of the least privilege, right? Principle of the least privilege should apply, uh, should be applied over here. And then even better, you don't hard code this user one, you put into secret manager, right? So more secure. Okay. Database, sorry, credentials. 
not residential database and credentials. The, the the key point to take note do not use yeah you create a database user instead create a database user let's say call user one right and just give enough privilege to this user one right what do okay so this part uh, I put a lot of efforts when teaching my students for this concept, right? But the thing is, since year one, we kind of get used to this approach in our lab, in our practical, in our sample code provided to students. Uh, looks like this, yeah. So we need to unlearn. Okay, so that's a part. Then, uh, so as I said before, uh, never ever do authentication by writing your own code, your own service. If you can use authentication service, right? In the context of AWS, you have this cognito service for you to do authentication. I use it in your application, right? So the, where is this? Yeah, Cognito, use the Cognito, right? So this is basically not tested, but it's just highlight to you uh, these services. Okay. Now, the last part of our security is called Web API throttling. So what happened is, what if uh, uh, someone call your web service or microservice from this uh, single IP address? This guy keeps sending requests to you, right? And then what happens is every second they send 10,000 requests to you from this single IP address, right? So we need to trot this request. Say, okay, you sent too many already. Uh, please send request again after five minutes break. Okay, you can do the throttling as a security measure to reduce the chance of denial of service attack. So in our application, we basically we are checking the request come from what IP address. We do the logging, and then we set the rules when the throttling should happen. Right, if you send to me more than one second, you can set 200 or 300, you can up to you. Yeah. So for the API throttling to, to work, you don't have to change your web API code, right? It's just somewhere in front of your web API, right? You can do the setting, do the configuration. So this is available as one of the features in the Web API Gateway. So in our assignment, when we use Web API Gateway, you may notice there is a feature over there for throttling. Yeah, for throttling. So you don't have to change your code. Your code, just before the request come to your code, this throttling can be controlled, managed uh, by using Web API Gateway service. Yeah, Web API Gateway service. So this is throttling. In the assignment demo, I saw some students, they are doing the logging of the API, uh, uh, the API request. Yeah, I think these are the important features. But the thing is, you don't have to write the code to logging this yourself. If you have any service available, like a web API gateway, they will do the logging for you. You just enable it, right? Okay. So this is an example we show you uh, in the case study uh, how this lambda, um, no, sorry, cognito can come to the picture for authentication. Instead of you, you do you do the authentication. So in other words, currently logging is come to 
you call the web service you implement yourself, right? Alternatively, as a good practice, don't implement authenticate yourself because it can be very easily broken. Once this authentication service impl implemented by ourselves broken, the rest of our application is broken, right? So as a good practice, right, try to use the service for authentication like uh, Amazon Cognito, like uh, Simpass, for example, right? Uh, Simpass, right? Simpass. So use this authentication service in our application. Okay. Well, continue to learn, continue to practice. Uh, congratulations, you have learned quite a lot and, uh, and I practice uh, a lot in our assignment and learn from your peers, your groups, right? So we, uh, I think we achieve our learning objective to get the fundamental concept about web service, cloud service, cloud computing, and then plus some of the sec secure coding stuff. Uh, these are uh, quite useful fundamentals for your guys to proceed to learn more. OK, so with this, thank you very much. And uh, that's all for the revision. So next week, we don't have class. Next week, uh, we will have only during the lecture time uh, is a consultation, right? Consultation, I think, uh, and a Q and uh, A about the examination where you prepare it, where you go through the quiz, uh, lecture slides, or, or of course you focus on the topics I have highlighted over here. I uh, quite a lot actually, right? Yeah, so I do expect some questions from your guys. And then before you leave the session, check for the exam, do we need to memorize code? All right, so that's a good question. Uh, no points to memorize the code. Uh, you understand the code will do, right? Oh, sorry, uh, I'm talking about cloud computing. Uh, cloud computing, no need to memorize the code. Now, actually, you see in the topics, I only put a quiz and then you try the quiz, refer to the module, refer to the module, try the quiz. I never put the lab over here, right? Yeah, so in other words, you don't have to memorize the code for cloud computing. Okay, good questions, good question. Actually, I have this in my mind. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> yeah, Guanji, good question, Guanji. Yeah. So uh, I have put in the blackboard, there is a survey for this term two. Uh, where is this announcement? I think this is a link uh, for you to complete. Uh, uh, yeah, so maybe you spend a couple of minutes to complete this. Uh, thanks for your feedback. Do we need to write any code for the structured questions? Uh, they, I'm talking about cloud computing part, right? Yeah. So the answer is no. Basically, these two questions are the same. Do you have to memorize code? Do you have to write any code? Right. So basically, it's understanding. Understanding the code. Understanding the code and understanding the diagram, right? Diagram is what we call architecture, right? Yeah. Yeah, from the revision slides, you will see we have so many lecture uh, pictures over there, right? So you understand what to do. Okay. Okay. All right. So later on, I have two groups demo, uh, demo, right? So I will terminate the session. I will start terminate the session. <laughs> terminate two sessions. Huh? Today we we'll talk about pre-authentication session, right? Yeah. So this is one session. I have terminate this session and start the new session. Okay, for demo. So the demo, okay. I will follow the time slots you put over there. 
and then we'll do the demo. So next week, uh, feel free to join us. I don't have any formal lectures. I don't have to talk anything. So it's just you give me the questions and then I see how I can help you to understand, right? OK, all the best to your guys. I think you have learned something very useful. Uh, uh, it's worth you putting your time and efforts to build up the fundamentals uh, for ourselves. OK, yeah, so this is what I am very confident. <laughs> I'm very sure about that, right? Yeah, OK, so I will terminate the session now. Um, uh, you're welcome. You are welcome. This class is very polite class. Very good culture. <laughs> All right. Hey, okay, okay, okay. So I will see some of our students later mm, during the demo. Okay. Uh, direct. Uh, you can. You can terminate. Uh, you can stop recording now. I think. Bye-bye. Direct, di di direct, direct, are you there? Can you help me to stop recording? Mm -hmm.